Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's event, In Poverty, Under Surveillance, Examining the Trade-Off Between Privacy and Public Assistance. My name is Alita Sprague, and I'm a policy analyst with the Asset Building Program here at the New America Foundation. And we're hosting the event today in collaboration with New America's Open Technology Institute and Breadwinners and Caregivers Program. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation because it brings together experts from a range of disciplines and provides an opportunity to explore an issue that has thus far received inadequate attention in any of our circles. That issue is the intersection of poverty, privacy, and data security within a society that has come to accept different expectations of privacy for families in different financial circumstances. We'd love for this to be an active dialogue, so I encourage all of you to be thinking about your questions, which you can either ask in person or submit to us via Twitter if you're watching online using the hashtag poor privacy. The asset building program comes to this issue through our work on making public assistance programs work better to support families' long-term financial stability, in particular by both permitting and encouraging modest savings. Many programs impose extremely strict limits on savings and require applicants to furnish a burdensome amount of documentation just to prove how little they have. Our research has shown that these policies create unnecessary red tape, impose a barrier to access, and as we'll hear today, reflect a system that often requires families to sacrifice their privacy to access crucial supports. Surveillance and legally sanctioned distrust of families receiving public assistance is nothing new. Policies have been in place since colonial times to identify the poor, keep records about their identity and whereabouts, and even inflict punishment or banishment for those who are able-bodied but not working. The overt violations of privacy that are embedded in our anti-poverty programs today are a legacy of this history, as well as a few key legal decisions, and manifest in practices like drug testing, finger imaging, and unannounced home visits. However, what is new are the risks posed by mass centralized data collection. As John Gilliam describes in his book, Overseers of the Poor, we've moved from a literal poorhouse to a digital poorhouse, where massive amounts of personal and financial information about public assistance recipients are stored and scrutinized. The risks of this are really twofold. First, there are the harms inherent in the data collection itself, which is often stigmatizing, perpetuate stereotypes about lower-income people, and can create barriers to access of, of essential services. Furthermore, these impacts disproportionately affect communities of color, which are already often subject to heightened surveillance by law enforcement. Lastly, extensive data collection fosters understandable distrust of government and institutions among people who participate in these programs, which in turn can lead to further marginalization. One example of this that we see in our work is the impact on financial inclusion. For example, asset limits and the accompanying requirement to furnish an incredible amount of financial information can create a barrier to having a bank account for fear that transactions are being monitored and may even be punished. The second type of harm is even more concrete. As client data moves from filing cabinets to vast online repositories, it becomes more vulnerable to unauthorized access. In Utah, for example, in 2010, a worker accessed a client database and released to the media, governor, and law enforcement names of public assistance recipients allegedly unauthorized to be in the United States. Two years later, hackers accessed the state government server and stole social security numbers from 250,000 people in the system, along with additional information from another 500,000. Breaches like these not only put individuals' identities and credit scores at risk, but also create yet another deterrent to accessing services in the first place. But the flip side of these risks are the potential rewards of integrating new technology into the public benefit system. Data matching and other effective uses of technology can reduce barriers, streamline application processing, and help more families enroll in assistance that they need and qualify for. But if we lose sight of the risks and harms caused by mass data collection and sharing, or dismiss these concerns as unimportant compared to many low-income families' other needs, we're doing a disservice to the families accessing these supports. And it will be increasingly difficult to stem the tide if these questions are neglected much longer. 
Our moderator today is very well suited to facilitate a dialogue about this topic. Sita Peña Gengadaran is a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute and co-leads OTI's Privacy and Security Initiative, where she researches the experience and expectations of surveillance and privacy by new users who rely primarily on public access to computers and the internet. Her research focuses on the nature of digital inclusion, including inclusion of potentially harmful aspects of internet adoption due to data mining, data profiling, and other facets of online surveillance and privacy. Please join me in welcoming Sita to introduce the rest of today's panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Alida. Um, and welcome everyone, including our viewers who are joining us by webcast. Um, many commentators of digital culture today talk about um, our always on, um, digitally connected state of being as a state of pervasive sharing. And for some populations, um, it's really not about that at all. Um, being connected and being always on means being perpetually watched, monitored, and surveilled. And that population is poor populations, including and especially low-income communities of color. Um, in my own research uh, that Alita mentioned, um, which is focused on privacy and surveillance concerns among marginal internet users, what I call um, members of historically marginalized communities that are coming online for the first time, it is evident that privacy is a luxury for poor people. They feel watched in all aspects of their lives. And as they come to depend on digital systems for everyday transactions, they face enormous challenges in becoming privacy literate. That leaves poor people between a rock and a hard place. Today, we're going to examine these issues further and drill down on the quandaries and consequences of privacy problems of being poor, digitally dependent, and reliant on public benefits. I think we want to pick apart the problems and potential solutions to persistent surveillance of poor people who seek to improve their lives through the support systems of social welfare. And importantly, we want to contemplate the role and responsibilities of government agencies who manage these public benefit programs and who create increasingly online-only systems for enrollment, case management, eligibility, and recertification. To do that, we have a very exciting group of panelists, a collection of speakers who have researched extensively, written about, and worked with the country's poorest populations. And let me introduce them now. Bridget Schulte is a fellow of New, at New America Foundation. Um, she has been researching and writing a book on time pressure and modern families in the three, three great arenas of life, work, love, and play. Her book, entitled Overwhelmed Work, Love, and Play, When No One Has Time, Has the Time, will be published uh, this February, March, <laughs> by Farah Strauss and Giroux. Um, sitting next to Bridget is Michelle Gilman, a professor of law at University of Baltimore um, School of Law, where she directs the Civil Advocacy Clinic um, and supervises students representing low-income individuals and community groups in a wide range of litigation, legislation, and law reform matters. To Michelle's right is Virginia Eubanks, the author of Digital Dead End, Fighting for Social Justice in the Information Age. Uh, Virginia also co-founded Our Knowledge, Our Power, a grassroots economic justice and welfare rights organization, and the popular technology workshops which help community organizations and social movements make the connection between technology and other social justice goals. And finally, we're joined by Megan O'Connor, who's representing DC at large, um, but also is an assistant director for programs and partnerships um, at the District of Columbia Public Library, where she oversees programming, 
for all 26 uh, DC public library locations, ranging from early literacy initiatives for young children and their caregivers to support and to support and resource resources for senior populations and everything in between. So again, the format for today's panel is our speakers will um, speak uh, for about five to seven minutes, and then uh, we'll kick off the Q and A. Um, we welcome uh, difficult and exciting questions, and we're also excited to hear from our um, viewers through webcast. So Bridget. Um, and I've been a fellow here at uh, New America while I was working on my book. I'm also a reporter at the Washington Post. And um, after the book leave and the book was finished, I returned to my job there um, as a reporter and began to focus on um, poverty and work life issues. I call it sort of the good life beat all up and down the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, so I'm. Um, uh, I was asked to share stories of sort of what it's like or what I would have observed sort of uh, these guys are the experts on privacy and to be perfectly honest I had never really considered the question before I was asked to be on the panel they said come and share stories of sort of a day in the life of um, uh, a low-income family what would they confront and uh, as I just have been going through my regular reporting uh, uh, day to day I, I, I suppose the one thing that has struck me is since they've asked me to, to uh, think about privacy, I am struck over and over and over again about how there is no privacy, really. If you uh, have made the, uh, if you are in the, such uh, a life circumstance that you need and require uh, government assistance. Um, so I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, I, I think the first thing that really struck me, I'm a, you know, obviously a middle class, middle-aged white woman, and I spent a lot of time in, you know, Ward 7 and 8 in D.C., and it is striking how in literally five minutes you can go into a completely different world, and as I, you know, as I've been walking around there and doing my reporting, I have been told over and over again, don't take your notebook and walk around with your notebook because everyone will run away from you. They're going to think that you're from Child Protective Services. So think about that. I, you know, if, if you have a, you know, sort of an expectation that your home is your, you know, your haven or your castle, um, it just really struck me how at any moment uh, so many people feel like somebody from Big Brother could or has or, uh, or, or will be arriving at their door to check up on them. Um, so I'll just give you a, a couple brief examples. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that was just one. Um, uh, for families who have fallen on the absolute, uh, you know, have uh, worst times and have no place to stay and you're homeless and you need help, uh, you go to Virginia Williams here in the, in the district. It's sort of a new system that they've got. And one of the first things that they'll do is they try, there's really good research that shows if you can stay connected with family, home, friends, you are much more likely to uh, move out of homelessness, to find a job, to um, uh, you know engage in uh, in more mainstream society um, more quickly uh, than if you go into shelter. You're much less likely to become depressed or have other uh, problems. It's better for children not to go into shelter. Shelter is actually a really bad place for families. Um, so, so the goal of what they're trying to do is actually a very good one to try to keep people connected with family. The problem is um, you have to go through, from what I see, you sit with a caseworker that you do not know, and they go through every single relationship in your family, and you have to give them their phone numbers. And then they call them and say, really? Can they really not stay with you? Are you sure? Uh, and sometimes they'll say, yeah, she can stay for a few more nights, or, or they'll say, we'll give you a couple hundred bucks if they can crash on your couch. Well, OK. Well, you can only imagine how tense that is anyway. So in a sense, you've turned over your most private Rolodex, if you will, to somebody that's a stranger who then will decide whether you are going to be bad enough off to get a spot in shelter in the first place. Uh, there's, uh, and then once you get in the shelter, I've, been, I've spent time over at DC General, which is uh, the old hospital that shut down. Um, once you get into DC General, you um, and you're assigned a room. You don't have a key. Somebody, a hall monitor, always has to let you in your in your door. You may not go into anybody else's room. You may not go to other floors. Um, 
You can only go to another floor if you have an appointment with a caseworker. So you have really, the only place that you can be alone or private is in this very small little old hospital room. And I was really struck, I was out in the hallway talking with a group of, of women, and um, three times a hall monitor came down and glowered suspiciously at us. So you cannot even have a private conversation. So, uh, you know, this may not be data, but this gives you a sense of sort of the, the atmosphere that you're, that you're living in. Um, uh, in another story, I, I, um, there's another uh, policy again. Not, there are all these trade-offs, there are all these tensions, uh, uh, you know, uh, good intentions and then how they work in practice. Uh, you know, another thing that you, obviously, if you're going to try to get um, uh, TANF uh, benefits, every last shred of data, you have to fill out you know, multiple forms for how much income, when was the last time you worked. Um, uh, interestingly, sometimes they don't ask about debt, and a lot of people that I know are in a lot of debt. Um, uh, anytime you have a change in status, you have to file that or you risk losing your benefits. Um, uh, you have, now there's a new plan because uh, the district after 17 years is now ending uh, TANF after five years. After five years, you can no longer receive, in your lifetime, no longer receive um, um, aid benefit. Uh, so what they're trying to do is really push people. The, the idea is this is not a hammock. You don't want to be too comfortable. Make something more of your life. So again, not a bad goal to try to um, have people uh, fulfill their dreams and potentials, but the reality is often very, very different. So they have people fill out what they call a, an IRP, an individual responsibility plan. Again, you do that with a stranger. And again, they ask you your hopes and dreams, and not only about your past, but what do you, what do you wanna do? And then they check up on you. Uh, and I, as I've gone through that process with people, I, I've often put myself in their position. What would I, um, it, you know, and it, it's, it's contingent upon whether you get your benefits or not. Are you sticking with your plan? And if you're not, then you can be sanctioned. You, get, you know, your benefits are, are cut. Um, uh, it's, um, I, I just pose that, uh, how many of us would be, um, some of these things are very private. Um, kind of what you hope or your five-year plan. Uh, you may not want to share that with just everybody, but uh, you know, if you, if you're in a position where you need government benefits, this is what we require you to do in our society. Um, uh, very briefly, um, uh, we've talked before, we've talked about the inefficiencies in the bureaucracy and how sometimes the, the data that they require and the way they collect it is so Kafka-esque and so inefficient that it actually defeats the purpose of what the program is to begin with. And the last thing that I'll talk about is the child care subsidy. Um, when uh, we as a nation decided to end welfare as we know it back in 1996, um, uh, I believe it was 96, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's like all of a sudden I had that. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I know, I had that like brains like, oh, I think that was right. Um, so when we decided to end welfare as we know it, uh, I think we all know that uh, there was a, a big investment into child care. Okay, all right, if we want single parents, largely single mothers, to go to work, then we need to help them. Somebody's got to look after the kids. Um, and so that the idea was there would be good quality childcare, you'd get a, a, a voucher or a subsidy to help you pay for it, that would give you some stability so that you could go look for a job, maintain a job, look for a better job. If you have ever gone through the process of trying to go with somebody who is trying to get a subsidy, let me just tell you, I, I, you know, I sprouted about five more gray hairs in just one day. We got to the line in D.C. in the morning at 6.30. The doors don't open until about 8. Um, thankfully, it wasn't too cold yet. The first person in line that day had gotten there at 3.45 in the morning. And many people, if you, if you go up and down, this is their third visit, their fourth, fourth visit. One of the things that struck me is not only do the poor not have a right to privacy, they don't have a right to their own time because you spend so much time waiting, waiting in line, waiting for appointments that are three months out and you need something today. Well, you can come in and for a drop-in appointment and then you wait and wait and wait and then you hand in one paper and that's not enough. You have to go back and get something else. And you know, I could tell you specifically what they are, uh, you know, but then we'd be here all day. Every last thing that you can imagine that you need to prove something in your life, you have to have a piece of paper for. 
Um, if, you have, if you're in school, that's not enough. You have to show your class schedule. If your classes change, it's still not enough that you're in school. You have to show your class schedule has changed, what those classes are, how many hours you're in school, or your subsidy will be cut off. You will be terminated, and oftentimes you don't know. The last thing I'll say is how many of us who've had children, their kid has a fever, you know it's, it's, you know, it's a fever, they're sick, they need to sleep, and in about a day they'll be better. If you are poor and you have a child care subsidy, you must go to a doctor and get a note that you, your child is not coming to child care that day. And if you don't, depends in different systems, one day, two days, three days, without a note, you will be terminated. Then you will have no place to put your child, you will lose your job. I can't tell you how many people I spoke to who were trying to get child care to go to school or stay in school or keep a job who lost their jobs who had to drop out of school simply because the process was so onerous. And that's the last thing I'll say. Great, thank you. Michelle. All right, I'm Michelle Gilman from the University of Baltimore School of Law, and I wanna thank the New America Foundation for hosting this important conversation, which is, I think, too often invisible. Um, one thing to note about the practices that Bridget told us about is this is nothing new not even remotely. We have a long history in this country of surveying the poor, uh, as was uh, briefly mentioned by Alida. In colonial America, every town had someone with the name overseer of the poor, and that person's job was to track the poor, chase them out of town, auction them off for labor. By the 1900s, our anti-poverty policy focused on poor houses, where the poor were confined under the watchful eye of the keeper. Um, who enforced very strict behavioral and work requirements on the poor. In the late 1900s, our poverty policy shifted again, but the idea of surveillance did not. Uh, the scientific charity movement was the anti-poverty policy of that day, and it relied on what were called friendly visitors to investigate the homes of the poor and to provide them with spiritual and moral uplift. And so you can see in each of these forms of poor relief, even before we get to the New Deal, the lives of the poor were scrutinized and evaluated by outsiders. And in the New Deal really cements this distinction between the deserving and the undeserving. Um, the New Deal, as we all know, laid the foundations of our modern welfare state. And despite its progressive origins, it um, has really reinforced, as I just said, the deserving, undeserving paradigm by treating relief for white working men quite differently than relief targeted for minorities and women. So for example, social insurance programs that were designed during the New Deal for white working men, uh, such as Social Security and unemployment insurance, traditionally have not carried a stigma. The benefits have been pretty generous. They've been administered under objective criteria, and they've been administered at the federal level. But uh, if you look at the programs that Bridget is describing, such as TANF, cash assistance programs that disproportionately serve women and minorities, those programs are almost always stingy, they're stigmatized, they're state administered, and they're very discretionary. And within that discretionary regime, surveillance and privacy invasions are the, a primary tactic for stigmatizing um, recipients. And indeed, over the decades, states adopted a variety of very moralistic and discretionary policies uh, for recipients of cash assistance. And this is perfectly legal. Okay, so here I get to put on my lawyer hat since I'm a law professor. Um, the poor do have fewer constitutional rights to privacy than their wealthier counterparts. Uh, in the 1960s, the welfare rights movement um, was successful in some regards in establishing objective criteria for welfare, but they were not successful in securing privacy for the poor. There is a um, seminal case on this called Wyman versus James that went all the way to the Supreme Court where a welfare beneficiary said, I do not want the state of New York visiting my home every six months to peek in my cupboards and check my trash cans and look in my closets to see what's going on in my house. So she challenged it. But the Supreme Court upheld the policy of home visits, um, holding that they were not searches that require a warrant under the Fourth Amendment. And the court reasoned that the searches were consensual. So you all can think for yourselves whether someone who is hungry, 
or who would otherwise be homeless without governmental assistance can truly consent in a voluntary way. Uh, when you look at federal privacy statutes, they tend to focus on the misuse of data, which is a valid concern, but it's largely a middle class concern, right? What happens to your data after you turn it over to the government? Um, federal privacy statutes don't get to the phase of data collection, and that's the point at which the poor are most stigmatized and humiliated, as um, was just described. So all of these practices, unfortunately, perfectly legal. And we heard a little bit about today's welfare practices. Many are old fashioned, such as the home visits I just talked about, um, fingerprinting. But with new technology, there are all sorts of new ways that the state evaluates and monitors public benefits uh, applicants. Uh, we talked already a little bit about extreme information collection and verification requirements. Um, that information is then automatically shared in numerous federal and state electronic databases. Um, I think we talked a little bit about fingerprinting, biometric in imaging, DNA testing is now connected to child support enforcement. Drug tests are becoming increasingly popular. Drug testing for a while was sort of focused on our welfare recipients, but it's spreading, yeah? So there have been states now enacting drug testing for unemployment insurance recipients. The House Republicans wanted to attach to the food stamp program drug testing for food stamp recipients. So you see uh, these drug testing ideas seeping out, even though uh, the rates of drug abuse among public benefits recipients are n lower than actual na national use rates, certainly not higher. And even though um, these programs, the amount of folks they catch are infinitesimal. So a lot of money is being spent on a program that is ferreting out fraud that doesn't exist. Not really fraud, but drug abuse that doesn't exist. Um, uh, another point that I wanted to make is <coughs> this isn't just a problem in public benefits regimes. So welfare reform from 1996 that we just talked about requires that welfare recipients work. And even when welfare recipients move into the low-wage workforce, they're still subject to much more intensive surveillance practices than you would find in the white-collar workforce. So we know that employers <coughs> quite lawfully can log computer keystrokes, listen to employee phone calls, review emails and internet usage, conduct drug tests, watch their employees on closed-circuit television, track employee movements through GPS, uh, require psychometric tests for employees, and all of these methods are much more intense in the low-wage workforce. So even for those transitioning out of welfare, the surveillance is still there. The privacy deprivations are still there. So one question um, some might ask is, well, isn't giving up privacy the cost of accepting governmental help? Is it a fair bargain? Obviously, a government program does need to protect the public fisc and make sure that the truly needy are receiving the benefits that they're entitled to. But as we're hearing and learning about today, the <coughs> amount of data gathered from the poor far exceeds what's necessary to meet verification requirements and is often gathered through intentionally demeaning techniques. And so I would argue that to the degree there have to be some levels of privacy intrusions, they should be proportional to the actual need for information. And those who ask that question also fail to see that middle class people also receive governmental benefits. We are all beneficiaries of governmental largesse in this room. Every single person here today, right? We get tax deductions for mortgages and retirement plans. We get child care tax credits. We have untaxed benefits on health insurance and life insurance. Um, <laughs> and this sort of idea was noted um, in some pretty powerful defense, uh, dissents to the Wyman versus James opinion from the 1970s that I talked about that had approved home visits. Justice Douglas said in his dissent, we don't spend this kind of money policing government subsidies granted to farmers, airlines, steamship companies, and junk mail dealers, to name but a few. Justice Marshall in his dissent said, if the IRS came searching the homes of taxpayers to investigate dependency exemptions, the cries of constitutional outrage would be unanimous. 
So it's really important, I think, for us all to recognize we're all sort of in the same shoes, but the paths we walk are quite, quite different when it comes to surveillance. So I will leave it th there and be happy to engage in this discussion further during Q&A. Wow. So um, I have lots of notes, which I'm now mostly going to ignore, because we've raised so many great, um, great issues. Um, so I wanted to mention sort of two things that seem to be sort of cross-cutting already and things that we might want to think about together. Um, one is this idea that public assistance entitlements are um, an exception to citizenship rather than claiming entitlements as part of our citizenship activity, right? That is actually being a citizen is claiming um, in governmental entitlements. Um, and so this assumption that um, entitlements are an exception to citizenship makes it possible to make the following assumption that you then have to trade away your political rights for some basic subsistence, um, some basic means uh, of living. So that's the assumption of privacy, yes, um, but also due process, um, uh, the ability to travel across state lines, right? Many of the things that um, middle class, professional middle class and owning class people um, take for granted um, really become a, a huge issue uh, once you start to try to access some kind of public assistance from um, the government. Um, I also really appreciated Michelle's sort of historical um, view on, on how programs that deal with poverty have, cha have um, changed and not over time. And I think that it's important to recognize that in many ways these programs are so quite so similar to the overseers of the poor and the keepers of the poor um, and really all the way back to English um, poor law. Um, but also some things are really, um, there are some very important things that are very, very different. And um, Michelle kind of suggested this, but I want to underscore it that one of the major things that has changed is this work that happened with the welfare rights movement in the 1960s that opened public assistance to people of color uh, because there were uh, lots of informal sanctions. Um, more or less public assistance before 1964 was almost entirely a white program. Um, and this new sort of regime of sanction, discipline, and punishment really rose when people of color started to access public assistance. And it's absolutely, you can't understand the culture of public assistance today without understanding that. So I just want to underscore that um, as well. So I'm going to talk, this is a very strange position for me to be in as a welfare rights organizer. Um, I'm going to stand up for caseworkers today a little bit and talk a little bit about the role of caseworkers um, and the role of computers in um, navigating privacy and public assistance. Um, caseworkers get a really bad rap uh, from pretty much everybody um, except for caseworkers. Um, from the welfare rights movement, um, we often see caseworkers as the sort of face of the enemy, right? So these are the folks who ask you questions like, um, it's illegal, but they do it anyway. Ask you questions like, um, what uh, sexual position was your child conceived in? Right? So not real popular with people in the welfare rights movements or with clients. Right? On the other hand, conservative political figures accuse caseworkers of fraud, of inefficiency, of poor customer service, and often of colluding with clients to defraud the welfare system. Right? Um, and this isn't accidental, right? Because most of the folks who uh, work in frontline casework in public assistance, uh, particularly in welfare, but also in child protective and unemployment and other places, um, are also low-income women, often of color, um, right? So there's a, not a mistake here. In fact, many people who are working the front lines of the welfare system in the United States are working off their benefits, right? So they have 30 hours a week that they have to be working under um, the, uh, the new welfare. Um, and a lot of folks work that off actually in the welfare office. So it's not entirely surprising that um, uh, more conservative critics would group clients and caseworkers together. Right? Um, so one of the things that has come up in sort of 21st century welfare casework is um, this uh, criticism that discretion on the part of caseworkers leads to um, unequal treatment leads to classist, racist, and sexist treatment, which continues to uh, create inequalities in the public assistance system. And this is not, this is actually well supported by data that this, this uh, caseworker discretion can have this effect. Um, one of the solutions, though, that has been offered has been replacing frontline caseworkers with computers. 
basically with automated eligibility um, processes. And um, the, I the idea behind that is that it's easier for uh, people to access programs if they can just do it online. And we'll let Megan respond to that, because um, I think you'll have some things to say about that. I heard your grumps um, about that. Um, that it will improve customer service, that it will improve timeliness. And also, one of the arguments is often that it will make the decision making in public, system, uh, public assistance more neutral, right? Less racist, less sexist, less classes. So, is that the case? Um, and I want to offer, I can't give you sort of um, uh, perfectly developed, uh, well supported answers to that, but I can give you really great anecdotal. Um, an anecdotal story about why we might be suspicious of claims that um, automated eligibility systems um, are um, the, the best way to go for clients and taxpayers alike. Um, is anyone familiar with the Indiana versus IBM case? No? Oh, good. This is, um, I'll give you the very short version of this case. So in um, 2006, uh, Governor um, Mitch Daniels of Indiana signed a contract with a coalition of high tech companies led by IBM for $1.4 billion to um, automate the eligibility processes of public assistance in the state of Indiana. Um, so it was called the Modernization Plan, um, and critics call it the Modernization and Privatization Plan, because the idea was to replace um, frontline caseworkers who were state employees with employees of this high tech coalition um, who would be private employees working in call centers. So the center of the plan was to replace in-person uh, eligibility determinations with online applications supported by call centers and call center employees. Um, so this was, this was the idea. Um, and Governor Daniels very much sort of uh, supported the idea that this program uh, should uh, be created because of these claims of caseworker fraud, um, inefficiency, uh, collusion, um, and other things. Um, so uh, the problem is that, um, among other things, call center employees were very poorly um, adapted to answer the kinds of questions that they got um, from, uh, from potential clients and applicants. Um, and there were perverse incentives built into the system um, to speed up the decision-making process, which meant that um, there were mass um, denials. Um, often the, the um, suspicion is there were bulk denials, that people just sort of hit the return button a bunch of times um, to c because their, um, uh, their s performance standards were about how quickly applications were processed um, and um, that people weren't waiting too long. Um, to hear back. Um, and in the first three years of the project, um, an estimated 700,000 people were denied for public assistance in Indiana in the midst of statewide floods and the, the 2008, um, so it's the, the floods and the recession um, in the Midwest. And the stories are really, really um, heartbreaking. Um, there's a woman who was denied um, food stamps and Medicaid because she was um, refused, refused to um, undergo a telephone interview, because there wasn't any more in person. Um, she was deaf, right? Um, but she was denied her benefits because she refused to do a telephone interview, right? There's a uh, the story of um, a nun um, who was uh, uh, declared um, uncooperative uh, because she missed an appointment because she was playing the, the organ for um, a holy day, um, despite many, many, many uh, attempts to reschedule a meeting, right? So. Um, thousands and thousands of these stories. In fact, now Indiana's dealing with um, a lot of lawsuits um, around um, uh, uh, unequal treatment under the law. I want to say one more thing, and then I'll, I'll move it on. Um, so um, the system didn't work out terribly well for anyone, clients or um, politicians. Um, Daniels uh, broke the contract in 2009. IBM sued for breach of contract. Um, Daniels and the state of Indiana countersued for basically IBM sucking um, at doing their job. Uh, it went to court. Um, uh, Indiana lost. Um, so IBM kept half a billion dollars that had already been spent on the system and was rewarded an extra $50 million um, in, in penalties. Um, so they're half a billion dollars down for that. Um, but the last thing I want to say is that it would be a mistake 
to think about this as a case of sort of technical bugs of like bad system design. I actually think it has more to do with the culture of public assistance. So I think many of these technologies could work quite well to do just what we talked about in the beginning, lower barriers to um, knowing what entitlements you um, should be getting, um, to making the system um, more transparent and more accessible. But in the current system we have, where the goals are really about punishing and sanctioning people who are trying to claim public assistance, these systems are going to continue to, to um, create similar outcomes. So really the question is about um, um, how do we uh, create a different culture of public entitlements in this country um, that um, isn't about replacing caseworkers with computers, um, but is about making sure that we um, support human growth, development, and freedom. Thanks. Great, and our last panelist, All Megan. Right. So I, um, I work in the District of Columbia Public Library, and as we talk about the shift of, of access to benefits to the online environment, applying for low-wage jobs, now in many cases you have to apply online, the individuals we're talking about who need to access these services to get these jobs, they need a place to go to do that. They need a space, they need a piece of technology, they need an internet connection. And really, more than any of that, they need someone who can help them use that equipment. Uh, at the library, part of our mission is doing that work, is helping people have their first experience with a computer, getting access to the information we need. And we love to do that work. But we see a lot of really interesting things. We see seniors coming in all the time, not all the time, but often saying, I just got an email that I won a prize. How can I get my prize money? And then we have a conversation. And we have a lot of experiences like that. And then we have experiences where I was talking to one of my colleagues, and he was helping someone apply for a job. And to apply for the job, you had to talk about your criminal background. And this particular customer had a record. And he really didn't feel comfortable sharing that information with the library staff, rightfully so. But he needed that help to be able to apply for that job to move forward in his life. Um, one of the key tenets of public librarianship in this country and around the world is a customer's right to privacy. We believe in that. It goes all the way back to our Code of Ethics, which was originally written in 1939. It's been revised many times, but always within that is the customer or the patron right to privacy. That's written into the DC Public Library policy. We say, where's my quote? The District of Columbia Public Library protects the privacy and confidentiality of all library users, no matter their age. It's right there in our policy. So for us, that means things like we don't keep records of the books people have checked out, and we don't track what people do when they're online. You know that's from? Like, what, when was that put in? In, oh, it was put in right around the time of the USA Patriot Act. And if you look back historically, many libraries enacted privacy policies right around that time and shifted some of their practices around retention of patron records of, of you know, once you return a book that is gone from your, your file now, we don't hang on to that information. Some people were upset. They're like, I want to know what I read. Sorry, you have to keep your own list now. Um, but, uh, and actually, if you go to our website, the, the policies are all dated, so you can see exactly when that one was enacted or last updated at any rate. Um, and we talk about the International Federation of Library Associations looks at these trends. And in their 2013 trend report, they said new technologies will both expand and limit who has access to information. And we see that reality every day in our libraries. Um, the issue that I think is really pertinent to what we're talking about today is that even though we don't save our patrons' information, we don't keep their browsing history, what they do online is not protected. Because they're, you know, they're in an online environment. If they're applying for benefits, they're, they're going from a place where they've had their first interaction with their computer, they've just learned how to use a mouse, they've set up an email account to having to dump all of their most private information into a website or an email and share that. And it's very interesting because I've heard anecdotally from my colleagues that people most often ask if we retain the information, but they don't think to ask what's happening to it in the place where they're sending it to. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the other real issue we face is the level of assistance required the amount of information folks have to share with our staff. 
I mean, we are, all of our staff are committed to patrons' privacy, so we're not calling anybody up and being like, hey, you know, let me tell you what happened at the library today. Uh, but it, it is a real moment of discomfort for customers sometimes to have to have, as, as you were saying, that interaction with someone who really could be a stranger. Um, the ways that we try and work around that are, of course, in our computer trainings, we talk about internet safety, privacy, protecting your confidential information. We have one course specifically about internet safety that we run weekly um, on Thursdays at 5 o'clock if you're interested. <laughs> um, and we, we develop a lot of partnerships, particularly around some of the online applications that you have to go through. Healthcare is a great example. We're working closely with DC HealthLink to have in-person assisters in our library so that they can sit down with folks and have that conversation. It's a conversation our staff aren't trained to have, but people are coming in asking those questions. So we try and bring in the partners who can provide that information in a more sensitive way. Um, and just a sort of a, a follow-on issue for us that's very interesting to me is in this age where everyone is really focused on metrics and data to prove your worth, we don't track patron data. So I can tell you that we circulated almost 3.2 million items last year, but I can't tell you the economic impact our support of the residents of the District of Columbia has had on, on their lives or the district. And as we try and tell the story of the library and advocate for the need for libraries, for what we know is so important, we have to try and think about how can we get some of that information while keeping to our professional code of ethics of protecting patron privacy. Great, thank you so much. If we could just uh, join me in um, applauding, applauding our uh, panelists for a very insightful discussion. Um, we have a limited amount of time for questions and while you, the audience members, and our online audience members are uh, drumming up some really exciting questions, I just want to um, follow up on sort of themes brought up in our, our, well, across our panelists, but especially in the last two um, speakers. And um, that has to do with what you would ask of either the systems or the people that are designing the systems. Um, that would make these online benefit systems better for the patrons or um, pro potential program participants um, that increasingly rely upon them. So if we could just move across the panelists and um, we'll ha I'll open the floor to Q&A after that. Um, well, I think that you know, clearly one of the tensions is if you're going to have a, a benefit, you know, there is this sense that you need to have a sense of eligibility for it, right? Uh, you know, and we have this, you know, kind of system based on fraud. We think everybody's going to try to get one over on us. And, and clearly there has been fraud and abuse. There's no doubt about it. But we, we tend to have uh, that as our, um, you know, uh, kind of a uh, organizing principle around a lot of these programs. So there's no doubt that you need to have some sort of eligibility just to show, yes, I am, I, I am in enough need that I really need this help. Um, but I guess what I would love to see is um, collecting it in a way, sharing it in a way that is, um, makes the program work as, it's to, as it should be designed to do, not to punish or surveil or um, stigmatize. But if we really are going to try to help single parents go to work, get an education, make their lives better, you know, move, uh, move beyond where they are, um, then we really need to have safe, secure childcare for their kids. We really need to have, um, you know, whether it's job training or connection with uh, real jobs in a real way. A lot of times people go to vendors, again, another place where you have to, you know, w in welfare reform, give a lot of information and they kind of sit around. Um, so collect the information, but use it in a way that actually fulfills the mission of making people's lives better. So sharing it in a realistic way, collecting, uh, collecting uh, realistic uh, data that you would need to, say, for unemployment insurance. Um, and nothing quite as onerous. Um, um, really rethink when sanctions um, uh, kick in or, or, or what you would need in, in, as an alternative to sanctions. Um, I think that there are some states, you know, maybe look at, do we keep it uh, at the state level? Do we move it to a federal level? You know, those are, those are other discussions we can have, but uh, there are some states that are doing, it, that, that have made some changes uh, and are doing it better. And uh, some, of the, um, some of the bureaucracy is not quite as inefficient and onerous and people get better, 
I, I want to say outcomes, but it's really their lives. Their lives are better. Michelle, uh, Virginia, or Megan? Well, obviously, computer code is only as good as the people who write it. <laughs> Computers don't have yet minds of their own. So there are just countless examples beyond Indiana where um, the coding wasn't good. People who were entitled to benefits didn't get it. And then the avenues for recourse were very limited given those mistakes. So it's apps and um, welfare regulations are very, very complicated. Yeah, enough sometimes to drive me and my students almost to tears trying to figure out what's going on. And we're the attorneys. So you can imagine. Um, what, how clients fare in such complicated systems and how people who are trained to be computer programs, programmers translate that into computer systems. So it's... Um, so is there anything specific? I'm just trying to drill down to like one specific recommendation that you would make, for example, to our colleagues that are you know, thinking about how to design systems better, how to reflect um, more efficient, more effective um, values and principles around social welfare support into the, the you know, databases that they're designing. Well, I just say you can't hand computer programmers a code and think they're going to translate the law accurately into computer programming code. There needs to be oversight. But I would also say on a, on a very practical level, uh, think about the user experience of the person using the website. Think about the individual who has, you know, doesn't sit around scrolling on Facebook all day, who doesn't have habits of how to use the internet. Think about making a website that they will be able to use easily. You know, we're, we're always going to be there to provide assistance, but if you can make it simple and intuitive and not reliant upon internet habits that those folks haven't developed yet, it will really smooth the process. And I have a short term and a long term because I think part of the problem here is that we don't want these systems to be simple and intuitive because we don't think people deserve public benefits. So the goal of these systems are to keep people from getting public benefits. So they're working perfectly well. They're not broken. Like they're doing what they're supposed to, <laughs> supposed to do. But I've got a short term and a long term I've, uh, 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 solution, a fairly specific solution. Um, I've had the pleasure of um, doing almost 100 interviews with frontline caseworkers and clients about their experiences of the computerization of welfare in New York State. And um, across the board, they all say these systems are not designed to do the things that we need to do to do our jobs well. They're not, um, you know, partially because we don't trust caseworkers, right? So caseworkers in Rensselaer County aren't given access to the internet, so they can't look up um, programs that are, you know, is this food pantry closed this week? I don't know. I can't tell. I don't have a phone. Or I'm not allowed to use the internet, right? So if um, if there's any call for participatory design of a system, like for political reasons, for efficiency reasons, for moral reasons, this is the one. We should be talking to clients. We should be talking to caseworkers about what they really do with the systems, and they should be key in designing it. The long-term solution is stop um, <laughs> stop means testing welfare. You know who has a great computer system, social security. Because we just like add up the points and send checks, right? If welfare was add up the points and send checks, then it would be fine. But what we're asking the computers to do is something they can't do, which is evaluate the deservingness and worthiness of human beings. And then that's the problem. The problem is the system is set up to evaluate the worthiness of human beings, which is not what it should be doing. And computers can't do that. Great, excellent. So um, in the interest of time, because we, we're actually scheduled to end quite now. No? <laughs> quite 145. Now. Okay. So um, let me just see a show of hands that we have questions, and I'll take um, w in this order. One, two, three, four. The first question is, um, I work with young people coming out of the juvenile justice system, foster care, and group homes. And one of my biggest issues around information in this tracking data is they haven't recognized privacy and they're very much oversharers on every internet platform. And, I've, and I'm also a coder, so I've written code and I've showed them how, like, when you put it on the internet, it never goes away. And I felt like, and maybe I missed it and someone commented on this, is I feel like there's a point where, like, educating end users and people who are on public systems about information and about technology and how um, information is being used to them so they can be their own advocates, one. And then two, the other question is about the technology part is I'm also a member of Code for DC and Code for America, so I'm one of those people who, who takes data and creates systems. And one of the things that I'm always saying is missing when I'm at these meetings and at these hackathons is I'm like, 
where are the people? Where are the people who are going to be using these systems? Where are the people who are going to be managing these systems? And one of the things that has me really nervous is there's this big uh, platform that's being built in DC, which is taking all the data from all kind of community services, uh, uh, social services that are being used in DC and collectively putting them together. And all the big tech companies are at the table, but none of the end users and none of the caseworkers. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like this mass surveillance, but it's one of these things where, um, Everybody's like, oh, it's okay because Google's on board. It's okay because because <laughs> the city council's on board. And no one ever steps back and say, um, maybe we should be talking to caseworkers and people. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts and you know invite you to like come to some of these hackathons we're coming to, we have because I think that it's important that people start having these conversations. Great. Let's take a moment to ask those answer those questions. Well, on the education piece. Uh, we do, we provide sort of basic level computer and internet training all the time and we are more and more building that into all the courses we offer and then we do also have one course that's specifically for internet safety and privacy. But I think that you said what really struck me is that people's time is not their own. And the idea that in a world where you are, you know, trying to manage a low wage job and have kids that you could pop over and sit in an internet safety class is you know, a little bit wishful thinking, where we found we've had the most impact are in those one-on-one -on -one moments where someone comes in and says, you know, oh, I, I won this prize, or oh, I need to apply for this thing, can you help me? And those one-on-one -on -one interactions are where we have the most impact talking to people about, you know, how do you evaluate a website? How do you make sure that what you're sending is secure? And those kinds of things. You know, and, and, and I would, um uh, just like to comment on the the whole idea behind sharing that information to begin with, you know. Again, these are these are good conversations to have because you've kind of got two different tensions here. On the one hand, you know, protecting privacy and is this a really good thing to have a massive bunch of data in one place that's so private about all of these poor people? On the other hand, the way the system used to work is you had to go if you wanted to get. Um, say your TANF benefit, you had to go to the TANF office and then sit all there and they were only open say Tuesdays from a certain amount of time for this particular appointment. You'd go there on a Tuesday so you'd either take off work or you didn't work. You'd spend all your day sitting there in the waiting room and maybe you'd get what you needed, maybe you wouldn't, maybe you'd have to come back on next Tuesday. Then you needed to go somewhere else to get your food stamp benefits and then they were only open say maybe Wednesdays and Thursdays and maybe Friday mornings till one or Friday you know till one in the afternoon so then you'd have to take off work or organize your day or do a drop in and go there and then give them pretty much the very same information and then say you wanted your child care subsidy well then you're standing in line because you call for an appointment and it's months and months ahead and you need it now so one of the reasons that from what I've understood mm -hmm. the, the reasoning behind trying to get all that data in one place is to protect people's time, mm -hmm. maybe not their privacy, but so that you don't have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks going to all sorts of different places giving them all the same data. So that's a real trade-off, um, but I can certainly tell you that the way that they, you know, they did it before certainly was a huge time suck. Uh, and we do see some clients who have opted out of these systems altogether mm -hmm. because they're so degrading. So in a way they have too much privacy, right? Because they are, they've sort of voluntarily cut themselves off from um, social services agencies that could help them. And it means their families aren't getting the housing support, the food support, the health care that they need. And so it's a balance, you know, it, it's trying to find that right balance. Great, right there. Thank you. Um, I've been on the Hill the last few days trying to lobby in favor of SNAP. Uh, SNAP is actually quite efficient, well automated, not embarrassing. It's a model of efficiency. That's not helping at all <clears throat> in the argument. I had teenagers with me who talked about hungry kids in their high school, you know, real stories, etc. So we're, I mean, we're looking at centuries of contempt for the poor, which seems to only be increasing. And our general response uh, often is to tell a story, to try to humanize it. I have these kids with me, they know people who are hungry. Um, and this is actually a question, for, I think, for Professor Gilman. To make any kind of change in something this huge, you've got to have some kind of leverage. And the leverage has to come with somebody with power. And ha have you, in organizing your students and groups, found any groups that you can affiliate with that will help you, that will intervene? I tried to get 
employers in Alexandria to lobby for affordable housing, and they always complain they can't hire anybody because they can't live there. They wouldn't do it. Well, we need a pow some power levers here other than our stories and our heartbreak. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't found the magic bullet, so let me know if you do. But you know, like one irony right now is one of the most powerful lobbies for food stamps right now is Walmart. You know, these big companies that benefit from it. And so you're finding all these very uneasy bedfellows now, um, but those are the entities with the power, but their goals are so different. So it truly is a challenge like to, to comment on that as well, which is that there's a very exciting sort of national movement um, uh, that is under sort of the um, coalition umbrella of an organization called the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And so in like sort of old school style, I'll say like we outnumber them. <laughs> um, there's 64% of people in the United States at some point in their life will um, claim means tested public assistance. Right, um, and so there's, it's the majority experience of Americans. Like we will, the majority of us will be under the poverty um, line at some point in our life. The majority of us will claim some kind of means-tested assistance. Um, and there is an incredible people's movement that I think is, is um, uh, growing and exciting right now um, around a process called the World Courts of Women on Poverty in the United States, which is a series of sort of truth and reconciliation commissions um, where people come together, tell their stories, and um, build this sort of this broad, strong, uh, cross-race, cross-class um, uh, national movement. So there's some very exciting things going on on the social movement level um, that I don't think have quite gotten to the point of high visibility, but um, I, I don't give them um, long to get there. So um, definitely, uh, I would connect with them as well. But when you hear, for instance, that now some representatives want to tie food stamps to drug testing. You just, it's such a backlash and such a push against these really um, grassroots efforts. It's very problematic. Um, in the turtleneck and then the gentleman behind. Hi, I'm Michelle Demoy with Consumer Action, um, a 40-year-old national nonprofit based in San Francisco and DC. And my work focuses on digital privacy. So I'm very interested in what you have to say. You know, our communities are people, disadvantaged communities, underserved communities. And um, so I, I was, what I've been really looking at mostly lately is um, a couple issues that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about. One is that most of the people in our, our communities um, access the web via mobile device, which presents a whole host of sort of other issues. And that goes to sort of w what I wanted to ask you to comment about, which was the intersection of commercial and government data, right? Which as we know, really, there is no line anymore um, in terms of, of one being one here and one being here. So I'm curious as to how you think that um, sort of data profiling has impacted maybe benefits or other sorts of, um, of things that would impact um, people in underserved communities. Then the second question I had was about the trend of smart cities. Um, something I've been kind of keeping my eye on. It's, I guess it's, it's less a trend and more of um, an overtaking uh, wave of activity in our cities um, where you know cities like DC are sort of coming up using their fusion centers and bringing all kinds of data together and a lot of it's in the name of public service like I know I heard of one in um, Boston where people could identify um, places in the road where there were potholes right but the people who were doing it were people who were sort of in a higher um, socioeconomic class because they knew about it had the means to do it and so what that was doing was highlighting places where not so much the potholes but sort of highlighting other sorts of metrics that the, the government was using for things like predictive data right for the police or for different sorts of profiling so I, I was just curious if you had any comments about sort of any of those <laughs> issues that I've raised so smart cities in, and in two minutes blur or less. between commercial and government data collection who wants to take a stab <laughs> No one else wants to, ju to jump in. Um, and I really am only going to be able to sort of confirm your interest by giving you more anecdotal information. Like, so the project where I did the interviews with the caseworkers and the clients, um, one of the things that really came up for people is that um, these systems, because of the devolution of public assistance and the privatization of so much of public assistance, these data systems um, require that data be shared across state lines because of the five-year time limit, right? So between levels of government, local, state, federal, 
and between private entities and public entities, right? So all of these welfare to work agencies, some of which are for profit agencies, right? Yeah. So this data is just, and nobody knows where's it, where it goes. The administrators at welfare don't know where it goes. Like nobody, they're like, it goes to something at the state capitol, and then some people take it, I guess, right? That's about as far as the analysis of that goes. Nobody knows who has access to that. And it's, uh, though it is really clear that there are intrusions onto those database, in, into those databases all the time. Caseworkers who just get curious and look people up. And we had caseworkers totally admit to that, being, well, we look people up all the time, you know, just like our neighbors and stuff. Right? Like, it happens all the time. Um, so that's a huge issue and something I don't know much more about except for we really need to be keeping an eye on it. Specifically because the great thing about paper records, though they're very inefficient in many ways, is that eventually you have to put them in a warehouse or burn them or throw them away or do something with them. The digital records never go away. So basically there's no right to be forgotten in the public assistance system. And I think that's hugely important. Like before there used to just be a space requirement that eventually your file would go away. Now your file never goes away. Um, and it's really unclear who has access to it. So that's huge. Um, smart uh, cities. The other example I'll give you is, um, I don't know if there's a, a social movement organization called Hollaback. Um, which does really great work around street harassment, right? So basically it's about reporting people who, uh, mostly men, who harass other people, mostly women, on the street. Um, but there's a really interesting story about Hollaback, which is originally they used sort of mobile devices and said like, oh, you should take pictures of these guys so we can hold them accountable. And so all these people, all these women with, with mobiles were taking pictures of people who were harassing them in the street. Um, and they, at least Baltimore ho Hollerback, a couple of, like a year ago, had to say, please stop doing this because all the pictures were of men of color, right? Because they're harassers, right? Like because of these cultural ideas we have about what a harasser looks like, what danger looks like. So it was all these like middle class um, white ladies doing important work. You know, street harassment exists, it matters, it's important but not doing it in a thoughtful way um, and doing it in a way that reproduces other kinds of inequalities, right? Um, and so that's the issue around smart cities, right? Is like when you give people these tools um, and they're not conscious of their own sort of internalized um, ideas about inequality and about what kind of what people are like, uh, what groups of people are like, you just re replicate those systems. interesting thanks oh sorry no. I'll just add that if you'll let me librarian for a moment I want to give you a book recommendation um, <laughs> Dave Eggers just wrote a new book called the circle and it's a satire and it's flawed in many ways but it's really it, it's a good conversation starter about these questions of how much can you put online how much should you put online what happens when you have to put everything online in order to vote in order to be a citizen and it was just it's it really dances with all these issues, and I think um, it's worth a read. Great, we'll go to the gentleman um, right there. Yes, you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chester Hartman from PRAC, the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. I caught two passing references in the opening statements to communities of color, and I'm wondering if there's more to that that ought to be recognized uh, and discussed. I'd be very surprised if race and racism did not have a uh, quite important dimension to all of the we're talking about today. And also, while I'm on the subject of demographics, noticing, noticing the composition of the panel here, does gender have any uh, significant role as well? So, you know, I, I would just say, you know, kind of just two observations, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. You know, when you talk about race, um, when I write stories for the Washington Post. Um, and I've started writing more ab about poverty this year. Um, I have actually, and, and we have this horrendous policy of on, allowing on anonymous online commenters, which I, I think is a really, really bad idea because then everybody's id comes out and maybe that, all that unconscious stuff that we sort of hide behind this veneer of civilization just goes wild. I have actually gotten to the point where I either ask them to turn off the comments or I ask not to have comments on the stories at all because it so quickly within the first one or two comments devolves into horrendous racist diatribes because when you cover poverty in Washington DC you are largely covering communities of color 
you're covering African Americans, intergenerational poverty, you're covering immigrants, you're covering you know whatever your your legal status is. The, it's horrendous, and I have been shocked and appalled. I mean, I, you know, it sounds like so ridiculous, but but it's awful, and I think that that's. You know, to be a Washington Post reader, you would hope you had a certain level of sophistication. And for us to get comments like that, that just go on and on, is really horrendous. So I think race is absolutely a factor. And uh, in gender, I will just say one thing that I was so struck by. I was doing a story on, um, it, it's really, uh, it was a story about asthma, which is really another story about poverty and, and communities of color and access to care. Um, and I was in the emergency room um, talking to a, a woman of color who was there with her small baby who had asthma. And um, we were talking uh, back and forth about her child. And, and, and she said, well, you know, and, and right now I'm a stay-at-home mother. And I said, oh, um, OK. Um, and she said, you know, I, I'm on TANF, uh, you know, that came out later. But it, it really struck me, because how many times have we have we ever, when you think of the word stay-at-home mother, we think, oh, it's a virtuous, middle-class person who has decided to give up their career or sacrifice some part of themselves to devote themselves to raising a child. It's, we've seen it as sort of a virtuous description. And yet here was a stay-at-home mother, you know, uh, on public benefits, and yet we never, ever, as a society, use that term to describe a mother like that. And it really struck me you know, the real schizophrenic view that we have, again, of not only worthy and unworthy, you know, poor, but worthy and unworthy mothers and, uh, and how we think about them, talk about them, and treat them. She's only got two years before she got work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, um, That's right. I think you're absolutely right. Everything we're talking about in terms of surveillance is sitting at the intersection of class, race, and gender, and the stereotypes often are generated um, from all three of those, but then they spill over to impact groups and people who don't even fall within those stereotypes. So, um, yes. So, and the answer is really simple, which is absolutely and absolutely. Um, so, um, I, the, the kind of regime of punishment and discipline that we have created around public assistance in this country, particularly after 1996, is impossible without our broadly shared racist conceptions of what poverty looks like in this country. The majority of people on public assistance in the United States are white. Um, communities of color are disproportionately represented, um, but are not the majority on public assistance. So that's starting to change. Um, and, um, and, and there's just outside of um, uh, the legacy of uh, race and employment and housing segregation and um, ideas about value and worthiness, we don't get the system we have now. It's totally propped up on racist assumptions. It's a white supremacist system. Um, and uh, around gender, um, it, it's people who are in public assistance are people who care for other people. And as long as we don't reconsider our gendered assumptions about who cares for children, the elderly, the ill, um, both as an employment and as a, a vocation, um, then it, that's, that also is not ever going to change. Um, there's, and I'm going to play librarian here for a second. There's a terrific recent book out called um, Disciplining the Poor. And I forget what the subtitle is, but it includes the persistent power of race. Um, they don't do as good a job on gender, which I yell at them about all the time. But it's by um, Joe Sauce, Sanford Schramm, and uh, Richard Fording. Um, and it just does a terrific job. Um, with the new culture of sanction, discipline, and punishment, um, and what that has to do with race. And the new Jim Crow, yeah, Michelle Alexander's new Jim Crow is great on that as well, though she's not so good at gender. So I guess I got to write the book that does both. I mean, one other thing that <coughs> Joe Sauce has researched that I think is an important point is that participation in these welfare systems of surveillance decreases political participation, and he traces the various ways in which that happens. And so, you know, I'm sometimes asked, well, you know, isn't privacy sort of a luxury? Shouldn't we just focus on getting food and housing? And I would say no, because these core human rights are just as important as the basic substance rights. And we know that deprivation of them has profound consequences for our political system, for our notions of ourselves as a democracy. And um, the harms uh, are quite concre concrete that poor people suffer as a result of surveillance. So, and 
that research about democratic participation, I would say, is one of the most profound harms we all suffer from as a result of these surveillance systems. I want to shift gears and see if any of our online um, viewers have posed any questions. Um, is anyone of our colleagues tracking that? Um, we'll take a question right here. Uh, <coughs> Yes, my name is Pat Corcoran. I'm retired, so I fit into your elderly <coughs> group. This is all about people and how they're handled and assisted and the rest. And at the core of it, it seems, are the caseworkers. What is being done to train these people? What new programs could come on to assist them so that they could understand their, uh, and, and assist them in doing their jobs properly, not only um, on a personal level, but also perhaps electronically? If I could jump in and, and respond to that, I think that's a wonderful um, question to pose and something that has come up in the research that I've done, um, which is focused predominantly on um, public libraries and community organizations that provide some of that frontline support to individuals that rely on public access to the internet and need to get into these systems. Um, one of the things, and this might not be the case uh, of DC Public Library, was one of the things that we found was that the library staff members themselves had um, deep questions about how computers work, how privacy violations take place, how surve online surveillance is taking place, what cookies are, things of that nature. And it really signaled to me the need to do some education and awareness and training, workplace training, around how do we understand and interact with these computerized systems. Um, and how do we share that knowledge with the people that have to do it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I think there's an incredible need for that type of intervention, um, and I'm sure all of you have something else to say about that, but I think that's a really important point. Okay, so I mo monopolized the, the answer. Um, do we have any questions from, not yet, so on, um, Yes, so um, online audience members, don't be shy. I know you're listening in. Use the hashtag poor privacy. Um, I saw a question in the back there, yeah. yeah. I just want to make a quick comment that piggybacks on this. Um, you mentioned the book by Joe Sauce, Discipline the Poor, and I just want to jump in and say that, A, a I think it's a great book also, um, but in the subtitle you were talking about, the first half is neoliberal paternalism and the persistent power of race. And I mentioned that only because I think it um, touches on some of the things a bunch of you had talked about with this nexus between sort of the privatization of some of these functions with the neoliberalism, right? We're devolving state functions, private entities, but also still ha has that sort of paternalist character of, you know, the government, you know, kind of these programs kind of teaching people about their role in these systems in society. Just want to put that out there. Yeah, question over. If you could just wait for the microphone really quickly. No, I'm going to talk too loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the benefit of our, uh, for our online audience. <laughs> um, especially the comment I was going to say it was about the um, training piece. And I actually think that there's something, I, I get very depressed about these things because I feel like the battle's been lost. Um, because I feel like the training piece is being privatized because of the fact that I work with a lot of big tech companies who have these philanthropy arms that then go into agencies to train people for free. And part of their training is kind of desensitizing them to privacy. So it happens, but it doesn't happen by state governments or by agencies themselves, but it, and I'm not going to name the companies, going in and, and most companies people haven't even heard about going in and doing this training and then telling people, yes, it's all right that all this big this data is getting used, and it's, but it's for the greater good. And so those are things that I think that we need to look at a little bit more. We'll take one last question, and then I'll just have a few concluding remarks. Um, I just wanted to make one more comment about um, the fact that the sort of privacy harms discussion is something that I know if you work on the Hill or you talk with any regulators, it's a really big question. Well, what are the harms, right? Whenever you get into that sort of trying to regulate or come up with um, some way to police some of the, the commercialization of data that's going on. I just wanted to say that um, there's been some work on dynam dynamic profiling and what happens online when you profile people who actually have um, are, are shown to be from poor neighborhoods or from minority communities, and it's very easy to figure that out, are shown higher prices. 
And then the other place where that can occur is on mobile devices, as I mentioned, when people um, from underserved communities are more actively using certain things that we, we say in theory we want them to have access to, like banking and financial services, but are disproportionately victims of identity theft and financial harms and fraud. Um, so there's also very concrete financial harms that are happening just from data profiling itself and data collection. So uh, I, I can comment on that really briefly, which is um, my past research, the stuff that went into my book, Digital Dead End, um, also sort of Joe Sauce inspired in many ways. But one of the big lessons of that book was that um, the, um, the assumption behind, say, the digital divide is that um, poor and working class communities lack access to technology. Um, and I found that that's very much not true. Um, but it, they have very um, different relationships with technology than most uh, professional middle class and owning class people have. Um, and that um, they come into contact mostly with it in two places. One is the low wage workplace, call centers, um, and other kinds of high tech, low wage work, um, and in public assistance. Um, and that they take from those experiences not just lessons about technology, whether it's safe, whether it's efficacious, whether it's work for you or against you, right? All of these ideas, but also lessons about politics, right? Um, like how safe is it to try to access government benefits? Um, how are your rights going to be respected? Um, you know, is it um, not? Do you know enough? They're all, you know, real smart <laughs> and know what's going on. Um, but these really important lessons about um, should you be engaged with these systems? which I think really leave people in very vulnerable positions around um, political mobilization and engaging critically with, with technology. So I think that continues to be incredibly important. Like the harm is really profound, I think, as M Michelle said, for everyone, not just for poor and working people. So I want to thank our panelists for engaging these questions and talk about, talking about really um, profound issues, I think, that are not talked about enough. I think the idea behind this event was really to identify uh, an opening to speak about this and take this work further. So I'd like to um, thank you um, for helping us move the conversation along. Um, I also just want to point out um, four themes that I think have come up and where I think we could do um, where we could have further conversations. So I heard four things um, throughout the course of our discussion. One is something that um, Virginia was just talking about that. Um, participation, and Michelle also, that participation in the welfare sur surveillance state ties into other inequalities, and we need to think that through and, and look at how they reinforce one another. The second thing is that technology and technological systems, especially, especially these systems that are part and parcel of the public benefits world, um, have values, and they come from institutions, and they come from people, and there's a lot of work to be done in realizing a different set of values that might build in greater efficiency and greater effectiveness in alleviating poverty, because at its core, that's what social welfare is about. Um, so, and lastly, I can't forget the fourth point, um, that social support systems are incredibly integral. So the people in conjunction with well-functioning technological systems and technological design can really help transform how we understand a digitized public benefits system today. So I'd like you to thank me, uh, join me in thanking our panelists um, for a really exciting conversation. And please stick around um, to ask our panelists further questions. Thanks so much.